Uh, so welcome to our final class. Our first speaker tonight is Jonathan Ortmans. Jonathan is the founder of Global Entrepreneurship Week and now the Global Entrepreneurship Network, uh, which he'll describe in more detail, but I can tell you uh, over 120, maybe 140 countries or maybe even more now and tens of thousands of events happened just a couple of weeks ago, all supporting entrepreneurship. Uh, and he's working all year round to promote entrepreneurship around the world. He has a, uh, an entrepreneurial background of his own, having founded a company when he was 19 years old. And, uh, uh, and also worked in Congress for many years, or for a few years, and then uh, has been engaged in policy issues related to entrepreneurship for a long, long time. So with that, I'll turn it over to President and Founder of Global Entrepreneurship Network, Jonathan Ortmans. Yep. Well, it's great to be here, and as always, Jeff, thank you. Um, you know, I, I, I told him I'm just waiting for him to offer me a job to come and be a full professor here, and I'll quit everything else, because. This is clearly the most fun place we like to be, especially in DC. So um, uh, thanks for including me. So um, uh, as, as Jeff mentioned, I've got a little bit of experience to share here. I've had two startups, I've had two exits, uh, uh, both of them, uh, one in the, in the United Kingdom in the microchips field, one in the US in the communications arena. Um, uh, but I'm an economist by training, so uh, I, for my, for my uh, uh, for my sins, I spent a few years on Capitol Hill, so I've also had some experience with this, uh, with this government topic. And in fact, um, uh, Jeff, I was thinking maybe I'm, in, in, I'm, I'm picking up on this conversation and think it may be a good place actually to start uh, a little bit of our conversation. I want, to, I want to go flip straight to something and I'll come back to com some of the other things that um, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about in, in, in my discussion. But I think the thing about government is really, really exciting because one of the things that we're witnessing is, as we all know, getting government to change is like getting an oil tanker to turn around. You know, it takes a long, long, long time. We always like to make fun of bureaucracy. Um, but one of the things that we have getting to operate now in 160 countries is a little bird's eye view of what entrepreneurship is doing to societies, including government. And um, we are seeing a rapid transformation in the attitudes of the public sector towards entrepreneurship. It all began a few years ago when we would have a hearing on Capitol Hill here in Washington, DC. And I noticed congressmen going up to Silicon Valley type saying, my, my daughter would love to get your autograph. And then I knew that they really wanted the autograph for themselves. So there was this rock star thing that started to build in and it was around the valley at that time. Um, but then we started progressing in a much more different way. So as you know, my, uh, my background is also that I work for the Coffin Foundation, which is a philanthropy based in Kansas City, that um, it, like all great foundations were created through the endowment of an entrepreneur giving money. Um, but unlike almost all the other foundations, we concentrate on studying and understand, understanding entrepreneurship. And one of the things that we've witnessed, for example, uh, over the last year and a half, is the massive scaling of the number of mayors that come to our mayors conference on startups and entrepreneurship. Um, we've witnessed not just what you saw in terms of the Congress, but in terms of the administration. I myself serve as the co-chair of President Obama's global entrepreneurship, um, uh, Spark Global Entrepreneurship uh, Task Force. Um, if you look at one of the things we've been charged with is looking at the one, over 1,000 uh, global entrepreneurship programs within the State Department. Um, there is a kind of uh, aurora around what government's doing that is uh, uh, very much excited about entrepreneurship. You obviously heard last, last week at Sounds or in the last lecture a lot about the, the specifics of how to engage local government officials. But last weekend, and in fact, uh, my, my, my uh, colleague here from India, from Startup India, was with us in Mexico, we had, a, we had a, a, a gathering of what we call our Startup Nations Network, which are advisors to uh, policymakers on startups. And what's different about them is that they don't wear suits and ties, they wear jeans and a t-shirt. Um, and some of them are working for the government, some of them aren't, but they are essentially focused on how do we come up with a, a way that we can help make government more savvy about startups, but also how do we come up with a way whereby we can help government talk to us. And one of the things that we witnessed uh, in the United States is this clash of cultures. 
And it wasn't just around the old-fashioned culture of business saying government should stay out of this, leave us alone, just you know, less regulation than less taxes. That's the sort of 15-year-old uh, standard talk you heard about the relationship between business and government. It's a lot different because now the relationship has become government, traditional universities and corporates um, trying to understand as institutions the culture of a bottom-up grassroots movement that's shaped around the world. As we all know, we see the world now not as a bunch of nations, but as a thousands in the entrepreneurship world, as thousands of thousands of startup communities across national boundaries. And so what we're really seeing now is this um, shall I say, rapid enthusiasm. We get to witness it at the Coffin Foundation because we get requests all the time in my office here in DC. We have governments coming to visit us every week and they've all got the same question, which is we're pouring money into trying to understand how to help startups, but we're seeing a declining rate of new firm formation in our country. What are we doing wrong? Or what do you think we should do in how to measure the performance of our ecosystem? You know, we had a visit from the mayor of Buenos Aires who came to see us and said, will you come down here with a team and help us figure out the methodologies for measuring the performance of our city's entrepreneurial ecosystem? And basically we got busy and we kept saying, you know, it's gonna be really hard for us to come down, carve out two weeks to come down and really help you. Of course, last Sunday, he just got elected president of Argentina. So we're sort of, you know, his, his message through his staff guy was, uh, so does this mean you'll come down now? Now I'm, now I'm head of state. But I think you'll find that there are, there are literally dozens and dozens of heads of state, of ministers, um, um, of other elected officials all the way down the road have got, the, they, they, are, they are extraordinarily excited to figure out how they can be smarter about talking and engaging with entrepreneurial ecosystems. <coughs> Meaning, I think it's, we're well past the point where they know that they're not smart about it and they know that they're in, encumbered with all of these limitations. We're now at the point of figuring out how do we do that. So in our organization, the Global Entrepreneurship Network, or GEN, um, I'll show, show you a little bit more about it, but on the government side, we focus very aggressively on the advisors to the heads of state that are trying to help come up with that smarter policy. We focus very aggressively on figuring out how do we get um, all levels of government smarter about figuring out how they measure their engagement. So um, I, I think the, the, the general message is time is washing away this uh, cultural barrier. And a lot of the time, frankly, you know, we start by, by in, in, in Africa, for example, there are 52 uh, shared workspace hubs that are in our network. And one of the things we have them do is to r invite their um, ministers to come and to spend a day just working in the hub. We say, don't give them lectures, don't give them paper, just tell them, come sit here. It's like a 1776, okay? So come here, sit down here, bring your laptop and just work and just sort of absorb the culture, sort of figure out how, is this, a, is this a, an environment that I could be able to engage with? Um, and so I think, I, I think we're seeing eventually this cross-fertilization of the cultures and I think you'll see the power of government much more effectively uh, leveraged. So in our work, for example, we are working on a whole range of policy areas. You mentioned immigration. Um, we're, we're looking at, um, you know, we've now got 14 countries around the world that have, uh, that have passed uh, startup visas. Uh, we're now looking at what are the reasons why they've actually turned out not to be very effective so far. So we're looking at a whole range of factors around what are the, uh, uh, the policy issues that are relevant to new firm formation. And I can tell you, it's a very different list to the list of issues that might be relevant to uh, SMEs or small businesses and uh, that's a very exciting field and the exciting thing also for the elected officials is you talked about this discrepancy to do with are we creating jobs or are we killing jobs well one of the things that really lit the candle for this in Washington DC from our perspective was at Kaufman we were able to get out there and look at data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and show that over the past 25 years all of the net new jobs that come from firms less than five years old. So that told us why are we doing this distinction between big business and small business as a government, the Department of Commerce and the Small Business Administration, why haven't we got it distinguished between new and old firms? And of course we know that new firms, yes, they create jobs. There's no, there's no danger. Of course technology is going to displace people, but the general organic process of constant new firm formation, it doesn't matter what happens to those firms, okay? They're constantly creating jobs and hiring. That's what you want. You want the engine, you want the dynamism. Anybody who's an economist in the room understands 
that it's, that it's the dynamic that you're trying to make happen. It's not saying, oh, we got this company and they hired all these people. And of course, you know, we all want to have some zingers or whatever that managed to create 3,000 jobs in three years. But the point is, generally speaking, you're right. There's a lot of startups that aren't necessarily in the short term going to create a lot of jobs. But the overall process of the, the, the cumulative effect of, of, of new firm formation has that positive net benefit for any politician. And I've not heard a single politician that won't support entrepreneurship work on the account of the fact that it's a job killer. They all feel like it's a job creator. I will say that some of them will also privately turn around and say, you know what, they step off the podium when we go back into the back room and we're having a chat and I'm like, you know, so do you really think that really encouraging the startups in your country through all of these policy steps you're gonna take is the key path to tackling your, I don't know, youth unemployment rates or something like that? And they'll often turn around and say, I'm hopeful, but certainly in my tenure as a politician, I don't think I'm really going to be able to deliver the results. Well, why are you so keen about this? I say, why are you, why, how do we sell you on this? I mean, this is great to have you at the podium. And they'll turn around and give an interesting perspective. And that is that the reality is, is that they said there is no better form of education in our country. So take, for example, the post-socialist economies. Their big challenge is that the average citizen's mentality is I don't really do anything until somebody asks me to do it. You know, that was the culture you were brought up with. And as a result, in order to create uh, a, a generation of people that wake up, take the initiative, are going out to form teams and make things happen, that the idea that even if those startups in that iterative process of going through testing ideas, val validating ideas, even if at the end of the day they don't succeed, um, at the end of the day, they've created more productive citizens. So the reality is, is that, in a way, the organic process of new firm formation, the whole idea of people forming teams, trying to create ideas, trying to validate them, trying to scale them, it actually, for many countries, is turning out to be an even a, a much more effective way of teaching people than having them sit in a classroom. So i got to say that, sitting in a classroom, because you guys are not really sitting in the classroom. You're engaged, okay. All right, so um, th that's a little bit about government. But I will tell you, because from our perspective, we're seeing government um, come up with, the, the whole ro world of research and policy is completely transforming what we're doing in the entrepreneurship field. So number one, uh, on the research side of things, I would tell you one of the very sad things that occurred at the beginning of the work in entrepreneurship is that we discovered that the kind of academic community that was populating understanding research around entrepreneurship were sort of adjunct professors of sociology. They weren't uh, Nobel Prize winning economists. So one of the things that we did at the Coffin Foundation is we really tried to pour a lot of money into finding people who are at the top of their field as economists, as, 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 as academics, and bring a little bit more academic rigor into the field. And of course, being an institution that has no customers and no constituents, you have to some degree a uh, responsibility to say things when they're unpopular. I didn't put our most unpopular study out here recently, which is to, uh, to suggest that venture capital is not exactly the uh, panacea that we all think it is, and is not always the friend to the entrepreneur. It's something I know that my friends at 1776 will agree, you know, we want to ask you to bootstrap as long as you possibly can. To for, you've heard it before, to be able to fail fast. Uh, but one of the things that we've been, here, here's some of the obvious ones. Um, so first of all, the stat I gave you before that it's bit sm small business, uh, the age of the firm um, uh, is much more important than the size of the firm, both in terms of the value to the economy, job creation, and the release of dyna dynamism. Um, this is one that I love because no one still ever gets it right. Uh, you know, the average age of a U.S. born tech entrepreneur, I kind of gave it to you up here, but 30. anybody want to guess? 35. 35, close. 39 last year, okay? So um, most people still think we're talking about people under the age of 25. You know, we've now, and it's, and it's not just in the fact we've got founder teams that represent, yes, some young disruptive thinker getting together on a founder team with somebody who's got unique knowledge of an industry and a whole bunch of history to bring to that industry and creating, obviously, a true innovation. Uh, but I think we're, 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 we're looking at dispelling those myths. And, of course, the myth that we love to dispel uh, uh, permanently, which is this, this notion that we should all be following uh, Silicon Valley, um, you know, that certainly, certainly the, the notion that we can replicate Silicon Valley uh, is, is, is for those of us that operate on the global stage is, is a kind of discouraging thing, something we, we, we try to sort of set realistic uh, uh, expectations. But I think, um, as I say, I think you're seeing governments around the world really, 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 especially behind the scenes, 
desperately trying to catch up with the entrepreneurs. Number one, they want to be cool like the entrepreneurs. You know, they're trying to wear jeans and t-shirts. They're trying to, you know, they're tr they want to be, as Brad Feld, the author of Startup Communities, talks about it, they want to be the feeders of the leaders, being the entrepreneurs being the leaders. You guys have probably heard that before or read his book. But the important thing about that statement is that in so many parts of the world, it used to be that government had this hierarchical top-down approach that government controlled things and guided things and set the, set the, the rule. And government still sets the rules and incentives. But what's changed now is that government wants to sit around the table. So everywhere we go, we will invite government to sit there at the table, but and we'll invite the university to sit there at the table, we'll invite the corporate guys at the table. But the reality is it's one equal round table. It's no longer, it's no longer something where people are, are fearful of the government. In fact, they're, if anything, um, say they're kind of lucky to have, have, have them there. I don't know, um, we'll maybe get a perspective from India before we close. Um, but uh, what this is really bringing is a whole different set of agendas. So we at the Kauffman Foundation can go collect a lot of data. We came up with uh, uh, early days of uh, ideas for startup acts, legislation that could be done. You've heard from a couple of people I understand on Capitol Hill about that. You know, when, you know, five or six, maybe, I don't know, seven years ago, you know, the word startup didn't appear in Washington, D.C. And then, you know, the guys at 1776 came along and Steve Case came along. And we at the Coffin Foundation actually had this sort of, you know, I'll never forget in the middle of the night, I don't know if you know this story. I woke up in the middle of the night and I suddenly realized, you know what, I've been banging my head against the wall. So I write a blog, okay, on entrepreneurship policy and on Monday mornings. And it's about everything from these kinds of issue, issues like, uh, you know, uh, payroll tax holidays or, you know, IP issues or uh, startup visas or uh, how to write rules for crowdfunding regulation and all the stuff that we think is relevant policy issues for entrepreneurs. And uh, I've been banging my head against the wall trying to work out why I used to work up there. I worked on the Ways and Means Committee. I know members of Congress and I couldn't figure out why is it I can't get anybody's attention. And then I realized it was just this word. We had been using the word entrepreneur. And we realized as soon as you changed it to startup, even if you didn't mean startup, all of a sudden it was like, oh, yeah, now that's something exciting and interesting that I can get my hands around and I can put my head into it. And it separated it ultimately from what was the problem Washington was facing, which the, the political forces didn't want to separate small business with entrepreneurship. So to the extent that you're interested in the politics of this, there's quite a nice bit of history about this with this president. That this president could not succeed in getting his own Secretary of Commerce in his first year in office and his head of his Small Business Administration to adopt a uh, small biz uh, sorry, a startup policy agenda. And so in the end, he ended up bringing in people, putting him in the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the, in, in, in the White House, and actually building the agenda from there and eventually transforming the culture of the Department of Commerce and the SBA such that they became able to take a, a bifurcated agenda. In the case of the Department of Commerce, they could do entrepreneurship and big business. And in the case of the Small Business Administration, they could do small business um, and they could start to try to do uh, new business too. So um, big, big difference. And I will say Washington's not necessarily in the lead on this. Washington has actually been slow to the table in changing its big bureaucracy to adjust to this new culture of all of this experimenting with different policy levers to make it work. And I use the word experimenting because, you know, I, I often describe actually a startup as not starting a business. I, I actually describe it as an experiment to students when I'm teaching them, you know, my version of the basics of how to do this, which if you're conducting an experiment, particularly overseas students, they get scared about this notion of failure. And I'm like, if you're conducting an experiment, there's no such thing as failure because you've just got results. Um, and, uh, and I think this is what's happening here with a lot of these things. Some of these were failures. I mean, the, the UK, when Cameron came into office, we went to see him, we came up with six things he had suggested, we suggested he did. They actually got the first one passed within six weeks, which was a payroll tax holiday. No one used it. Parliament said basically if it doesn't, you know, if you don't have this degree of use within two years, it's going off the books. So no one used it. So, I mean, a lot of these things are experiments and, you know, sometimes we are actually too fast. We couldn't actually sell it fast enough. So, um, so he here's what we're trying to do to kind of uh, uh, address this issue of what we see is the challenge, which is we've seen an explosion of programs, uh, but, a, that, but still in most countries, a declining rate of new firm formation. I just testified on Capitol Hill um, uh, recently about why we're seeing rates of new firm formation decline, and actually since then, we've actually started to see the first positive trend going back to the fact that we're now seeing 
uh, more new firms uh, created in the United States. But we're still trying to work out uh, various strategies around what do we do about the fact that we have to improve the performance of what we're doing to support entrepreneurs. So what we're trying to do with, um, uh, with, with our work, with the Global Entrepreneurship Network, is that first of all, we brought together all the people that pay for the research. Um, you know, everybody else likes to bring together the, the best academics in the world. We brought together uh, the institutions that we discovered were writing the biggest checks to the academics to conduct research. And we discovered that they really had no interface with each other. They had no alignment to what their agenda was. And so one of the things that we've really worked hard to try to do is to bring together everybody from the World Bank and the Coffin Foundation and Nestor in the UK and the Saputra Foundation in Indonesia and a whole range of other foundations that actually write checks to support entrepreneurship to get them to come together and align, uh, align, align their research agenda. As I mentioned uh, last week in Mexico under the patronage of the president of Mexico and the, the economic minister there, uh, we had our Startup Nations community, which you know, for us will, will be this growing group. It doubled in size this year to 60 countries of, uh, of, of people that are interested in figuring out smarter policy, guided um, by research that can be demanded of our Global Entrepreneurship Research Network. We're also doing a variety of other research products. We have an index that measures entrepreneurial performance across 130 countries. Um, and we are... Um, uh, on, on, on top of that, let me just see if I can find this slide, we are figuring out how, um, uh, how to roll out new research products. So this gives you an idea of how we look at the global entrepreneurial um, ecosystem. And, and, and the critical thing here, for, and, and Jeff has heard me say this before, and I'm, I'm sure all the guys at 7076 when they're running the Challenge Cup or looking at their federation of, um, of networks would tell you the same thing, and that is that our experience in working in 160 countries now, we've been running this thing called Global Entrepreneurship Week for a number of years, which is essentially a big celebration to try to increase the number of people that are taking an interest in the field. And I think we were part of the overall effort to try to have that global revolution. And I think now we have very few countries, whether we're working in Libya, Venezuela, Myanmar, any of these countries where you know, people told us we would get a frosty reception. Uh, we, uh, we, we really think the entrepreneurial spirit is well and truly lit in every part of the world. And we're in 160 countries, we could be in more, but, but I will tell you there really isn't anywhere where you can't embed entrepreneurship. It's, it's extraordinary and exciting. Um, but what, what we, 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 we recognized in this effort was that we needed to do something that would figure out how do you treat the global entrepreneurial ecosystem as one entrepreneurial ecosystem. Because we discovered that as we began to bring people together for live gatherings, that the, the, the common culture that they shared across all of these startup communities was something that was remarkable, but not really being leveraged. Um, and you know, you guys have all heard of Startup Weekend. Uh, there's an example of, of how you could bring up Startup Weekend this all together. And uh, just like with our community overall, you could, you could put them all in the room, switch their passports around, send them home, and with the exception of some language issues, they would fit right back in. They went right back into the pocket in that community. Um, and as a result, we found exactly the same thing. So what we've been trying to do on the research side, on the program side, uh, and on the, uh, the, uh, the side of, of, of bringing together clusters of entrepreneurs, um, to be able to, to, to look at that as one global entrepreneurial ecosystem. Uh, and the, the, the primary driver of that is that we think that we can do something that's bigger than the sum of the parts. We've already got evidence that that's occurring in certain arenas. Uh, and that we think that we can bring some of the rules to creating a successful entrepreneurial ecosystem that, um, that I know you've, you've talked about um, on a global basis the, from, from a very local basis. So just very quickly on that front. So a lot of our research shows there are four things. I know 1776 focused on one of them um, uh, in particular, which is w that we think is absolutely vital, which is connectivity. So if you're building an ecosystem, whether it's in a local, you know, in one neighborhood in a city, or whether you're trying to build it globally, you have to have connectivity. Connectivity leads to absolutely everything. And to come to this point about who you know, you were talking about the cousin you know, the cousin of the mayor or whatever, okay? You know, I have to say, it's, it's, really gone, it's, it's really moved past its who do I know, who knows. But I will say that this is the advantage that this generation has, is that you're hardwired connected already. 
And building communities is part of the homework that you do. And so it is who you know. And almost anything you need as a startup is going to be two or three degrees from separation. So you may not know the congressman. And by the way, you don't have to know the congressman or the senator. I mean, actually, most members of Congress really have very little power to do anything as individuals. But you're going to know someone that knows how to be able to figure out how to get something done. And that's what you've got to focus on. Who are going to be your change agents in different sectors? You can't become an expert on the Congress. You can't become an expert on every you know, local and state uh, regulatory uh, matter. But you can certainly figure out how, who, who, would I, who would I talk to who would know how to be able to do that. So you're building your communities as startups. And you're building. Uh, so that connectivity is everything to us. It's, it's everything around. It's where you're going to find your funders. It's where you're going to decide whether you should pivot on your product. It's where you're going to decide. Uh, whether or not you're going to have a regulatory uh, risk further down the road, you know, all of these things, your, your community. And the reason is because entrepreneurs now don't sit and absorb. Entrepreneurs now pull stuff. They pull it from electronic sources, they pull it from the communities, and they pull it from the shared workspaces that they, uh, that they collaborate in. And so right now, all you need to be doing is working out, all entrepreneurs have to be able to do, is to figure out how to build these communities. Um, uh, and you know, that's why a lot of people call it community building. OK, the second thing is um, you know, of these four things that we're trying to build into the ecosystem. And so connectivity, we're obviously very big on that. Um, we're also trying to build density. So um, we can't take the whole world and do it, uh, but we need to have specific pockets of density. So we know that as entrepreneurial ecosystems, they need to be able to see density. We need to be able to see fluidity, which means that people have got to be able to move with, in and out of traditional professions. They have to be able to move from one arena to another in order to be able to bring that kind of, um, uh, uh, shall I say, constant freshness. I mean, most people don't want to stick with a job more than two years. So communities, in entrepreneurial communities, are even more fluid. You've got to allow a process, you know, an ecosystem that does that. And finally, uh, diversity. Um, as we all know, a lot of the best ideas in the world come at the intersection of disciplines and ideas. Um, and you have to be able to see that kind of diversity in the community. And one of the things that you know, the, the global entrepreneurship community just inherently has is extraordinary diversity. It's extraordinarily exciting. I bet if you ask any of the people that work in any of our operations uh, overseas, you'd find that they all would also tell you, yeah, I have an office in 160 countries. Or more importantly, I, have, I, I pretty much know someone in every one of these communities. Uh, and that brings a real richness to it, not just culturally, not just because we care about that in the world, uh, but I think in terms of the ability of entrepreneurs to succeed. So we're working on some of those primary factors in building both encouraging the programs and the understanding that we have around local ecosystems, as well as in terms of understanding the global entrepreneurial ecosystem. So I think I'll wrap up there and take some questions. Um, uh, I will certainly happy to talk to you more about what we do, but I don't think you guys are really interested too much in too many of those details. Um, but I'll tell you what, I'll leave this up here on, on that note so you've got that. Uh, but uh, thanks very much.